and welcome to the house of the Lord this morning. It's so great to join with you all as we come and as we worship and give thanks to our good and loving God. And welcome to those who are joining us on the live stream. Uh, we pray that you would all feel the moving of the Spirit this morning. And this morning we take this call from Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. What a beautiful call for each of us this morning. I'm going to invite you to join. Please stand as we declare this morning that we will enter his gates with thanksgiving in our hearts and, our, and enter his court with praise. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. made me glad. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad, and my prayer is that he has made you glad too, and that you will rejoice each and every day. Let us now come and declare that it is the time to worship. Time to worship. 
sheep. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are. as you are before your God. Come. Amen. Let us now draw into a time of prayer. Draw into the Lord. Let us open our eyes. Let us open our minds and our hearts to our Lord this morning. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you. To see you, to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. we sing holy 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 i want to see living and loving God. As we commence our time of worship together, Lord, I just pray, I just pray that you would just prepare us, that you would open the eyes of our heart, Lord, as we've just sang. That, Lord, that we wouldn't be distracted by the things going on around us, that we won't be distracted about whatever might be going on in our life, but that we could just come into your presence just as we are, that you would use us, that you would shape us into the people that you always intended us to be, Lord. So, Father, I pray that you would move mightily in this place, Holy Spirit, rain down in this place. Bless us, Father, I pray, in the precious name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Please be seated, my friends. Well, good morning, everybody. 
It's great to see you here today. Uh, thank you for resisting the urge to instead go to the Wiggles concert. I think a couple might have been tempted. A couple came in and said it's on. There's quite a crowd up there, but we're going to have a, a better time here this morning, as fun as the Wiggles are, I'm sure. Of course, yeah, well, we can, you can do the fingers if you like. And, yeah. uh, some announcements I'm doing from memory. I couldn't be bothered writing them down. Always dangerous, but anyway, I'm doing from memory. First one is to remind you that this week the Christian Life and Witness course starts. This is part of the Billy Graham Evangelistic uh, Association uh, events that are, will take place in May. Uh, so the course goes for three weeks, uh, three 90-minute sessions at various uh, church locations around the city and on various days of the week. So I'd really encourage you, if you do have that time available, just really encourage you to make that time available and go along to one of these Christian Life and Witness courses. I think I know about four people so far from the congregation that have committed to doing that. So there's one at the Door of Hope, there's one at Gateway Baptist, uh, St John's on Wednesday night. So there's uh, lots of different options there uh, that you can take a look at. So these cards are up the back. There's plenty of them there that have uh, the dates and times or you can jump onto Facebook, uh, Launceston Churches Together and find details there. No need to pre-register, uh, but you can, they said, if you like, jump on Facebook and say you're going on the particular event just so they know how many copies of stuff to print off and things like that. But um, if you want to be able to pray with people uh, who might make a decision for Christ at the public events in May uh, when Will Graham is here to preach, uh, you have to do this. Um, but of course you can just do it for um, our own discipleship and our own training in evangelism as well. Two. Next Sunday, we're going to have a visit from Johanna from Compassion Australia, who will be coming to talk uh, to us. She visited us last year about this time in February as well. So I encourage you to come along and uh, just hear uh, once again and, and further of the work that the Compassion uh, do right around the world. And just to let you know that uh, from our uh, open plate offering on that day, uh, the church here will, of course, make a donation through to the work of Compassion. So uh, just be aware of that if you'd like to help contribute in that way as well through that love offering. Three. Relay for Life. So that's on the third weekend of March. I think the uh, 17th, 18th, 19th of March. Uh, that's an event that raises uh, money for the Cancer Council, obviously, and all the work that they do there. So YFM have once again uh, entered a team and invited anyone from the Salvation Army to come along and participate in that as well. I think last year we had four or five uh, from the Salvos in, in um, conjunction with the YFM team. It was a great event there uh, just to share in that way. So if you want to sign up for that, uh, just see Kelly, myself or Dave uh, to get more details on there. I think we've got... Liddy's already signed up again. Is that right? Yep. So there's one already. So if you, you don't have to walk for hours and hours. You might just be able to, you know, might say, well, I can you know, walk an hour or two, you know, around the track with a break in between. So... Uh, don't think you have to commit to you know hours and hours of walking if you want to get involved and just help support the cancer council there. And the last one is on in the foyer out there. You'll see I think we've got three tables in the end of um, quite a number of books that are available for anyone that would like them uh, as part of their recent move. Kevin Jude had just been doing a little bit of cleaning out and a little bit of a reluctant, I think, cleaning out in some instances. Uh, so uh, please take the opportunity to look through there and uh, you'll. Um, I think there's some gems there you'll be able to pick up if you're a reader and uh, yeah, sort of find something of interest there. So certainly take a perusal over those. We'll continue in worship. Thank you for the giving of our tithes and offerings. Thanks, Meredith.
our Father, as children of you, our loving God, we are the most blessed of people in the entire world. We thank you, Lord, that you just love us, love us. And, we, and you show that love often and such blessing towards us. And Lord, you bless us with the ability to be able to return to you that overflowing abundance of what you have given to us. So we thank you this morning for that opportunity to return some of your blessings back to you and your kingdom. May, our, may it be used wisely. We pray for those who distribute what we've given today and those who are blessed by what we have given today. We thank you, Lord. Amen. We come to that time of year once again uh, when we launch our self-denial appeal uh, for 2022. I know many of you will be very familiar uh, with the appeal and that it takes place uh, every year. Uh, so, but perhaps some of us um, aren't as familiar with that. But first of all, I just want to say thank you once again for uh, the rich history and legacy of the sacrificial giving to the self-denial appeal that this congregation has. Last year, uh, we set a new record. We raised over 20000 or donated through over $20,000 to that. I think, as I said, um, they send out these reports these days, and from that you can tell that the average gift that is given per giver places us you know, in the top ten of uh, core around Australia. So very, very sacrificial givers, and thank you for your support. For those that aren't familiar with it, uh, the self-denial appeal is um, our major appeal each year that supports the work of the Salvation Army right around the world in the 131 countries, uh, I think it is, in which we operate. And it's an, uh, the self-denial appeal takes place in every one of those places. And so it's the whole world army uh, supporting uh, the work that takes place in each of those locations. And the challenge uh, in the weeks ahead, we'll talk more uh, once again a little bit about the history and our, of the origins of our self-denial appeal. But the challenge that is there is to give one week's salary uh, to the appeal as a sacrifice and support of both the evangelical work of the Salvation Army and the development work. Uh, for projects and um, community development. So the Elder Service will take place on the 3rd of April. There'll be lots more info coming out in the uh, following weeks, uh, further letters, uh, the giving envelopes, things like that. You, know, you, you would have received uh, the letter today from our territorial leaders, Commissioners Robert and Janine Donaldson. I uh, saw a number of you already reading that through there. I just want to read a little excerpt from that. The Salvationist's heart cries to make a real and profound difference where we are and to see the cascading effect of our faithful efforts continuing to ripple through our faith community and around our world. Your support ensures the Salvation Army can continue its unique calling to be an influence for justice and hope in a chaotic world. As dedicated Salvationists, our inward desire energises upward prayer, which empowers outward action that accelerates onward ripples. Once again this year, we are asking you to prayerfully consider your personal sacrificial gift to the self-denial appeal. And as you'll see in the video in just a short moment, the theme of this year's appeal is the ripple effect, how our small actions can create, I suppose, a ripple effect of um, change and blessing uh, that we can never imagine. So there's uh, also a few devotion books out the back. We've only printed 10 in the interest of saving paper. So if you really do need a paper copy, grab one of those. If they run out, I might print some few more. But I'll email out the PDF. I'll do one of those uh, sort of global emails. So you'll get the PDF uh, later this week. Uh, officially starts next Sunday. So you won't be behind or anything if you wish to track through on that devotional book there. And the last thing I'm going to put out today is in terms of a faith target once again. I know perhaps um, we can't just keep... Uh, raising and raising the bar perhaps, but I'm hoping perhaps we can get a greater number of people involved this year and increase that target that way. And I think in 2022, for, let's aim for a target of $22,000. That's about 1,500 more than last year. 
So let's uh, commit that to prayer and faith and see if we can hit, oh, I like this, you know, symmetry in numbers. So let's see if we can hit that 22,000 in 2022. Well, let's watch the first video through. Thanks, Edwina. God is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. And he does that through his power within us. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. From the beginning of time, the Spirit of God was present like a ripple over the water. And throughout the Bible, we see how the Spirit of God continues to lead his people through the history of the Israelites to the coming of the Saviour, Jesus Christ. In Luke chapter one, we recount the angel saying to Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Throughout Jesus' ministry, the Spirit of God was with him. The Gospel according to Matthew tells us in chapter 3 that as soon as Jesus was baptised, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And towards the end of his time on earth, he promised his followers the Spirit will come to help them. In John chapter 14, we are reminded of Jesus' words to his followers. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper who will be with you forever. That helper is the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it does not see or know him. You know him because he lives with you and will be in you. And the Spirit of God has continued to lead Christians, energizing them to do his work, to share the gospel and honor God. And the ripple effect continues today to the corners of the earth. Today, the Spirit is alive in us, leading us into mission, both at home and abroad, to bring the eternal hope we have in Jesus Christ, our Savior, to all. We join Paul in his letter to the Ephesians in chapter 3, verse 20, saying, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us through his Spirit, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. Because of the COVID global pandemic, our film crew were not able to travel overseas to capture the benefits of self-denial funding. So this year, in the Self-Denial series, we will meet some amazing men and women who have followed the call of God into officership and then were led by the Spirit to other countries. These officers have seen firsthand how self-denial funds can transform individual lives and entire communities. Their dedication and the generous donations of others to the self-denial appeal has caused a ripple effect that has brought a positive change for generations to come. Not only in practical ways through healthcare, education and clean water, but in spiritual ways, in their eternal salvation through the love of Jesus. God plans beyond what we could ever dream to imagine or ask and his power lives in us. 
I encourage you throughout the self-denial series to reflect on how the Spirit is at work in your life and how you can sacrificially support the international mission of the Salvation Army. Our earthly sacrifice now can lead to a ripple effect of change for others and the eternal salvation of those who come to know Jesus Christ. look forward to hearing more of those stories in the coming weeks, I'm sure, as we prayerfully consider uh, our giving to the self-denial here once again. One of the uh, great privileges in my role is um, just uh, people coming to share with me at various times about what is God is doing and, you know, the testimonies and just the faithfulness of God. Uh, two occasions this week uh, I had that happen and I said to both of them, would you like to share uh, your testimony of the wider congregation? And we have one of those people today. So I'd invite Colin Cocker to come forward and he's going to share his testimony with us. Thanks, Colin. Pull the mic out there for you. I've got some notes because uh, my memory's not so good. So I've got my wife's glasses because I can't see. Um, so you'll be pleased to know I can't see it, it won't take long. Um, a few months ago I lost my wallet, uh, I don't know what I told you, whether you prayed for me or whether we, you did, yeah, thank you, and, um, sorry? Am I allowed to take it off? I don't know. Well, I lost my wallet uh, the week before Christmas and uh, didn't know where it was. Didn't have a clue where it was. Only, only God knew where it was. And on the 26th of December, a lady knocked on the door and she said, is this your wallet? We found it in the service station where I went to get petrol. Um, this week it's happened again. Uh, over the last couple of weeks, I've been, probably some of you wonder, especially the ladies, why I look at you really hard, because I can't see. And I understand Lydia's uh, last few months, because now I've got to put my hands, uh, myself in the hands of a surgeon. Um, and he says that um, it's only a minor operation, but uh, from my side, from my side of things, I see it as a major operation. So, you know, my wife's grandmother used to say, "There was a wise old owl who sat on a tree. The more he saw, and the less he spoke. The less he spoke, the more he saw." And I think that's uh, what's happening to people like me, who are over 70, 71, 72. And um, so that's happening tomorrow. I'm sorry I'm quite a bit nervous. Um, I've come to realise more and more that my life is in God's hands and that not only does he support our overseas missionary work, but his kindness and his love extends to us and our families in our own situations right here in this place, right now, in, with our own families, our loved ones, our children. Um, and over the last few months, I've been particularly moved by the fact that Lord not only supplies our needs uh, physically, emotionally and spiritually, but he's interested in us as spiritually as well. So I just wanted to share you with you this because six months ago the private health fund took our thing 
off their list and we've been praying, paying private health for a long time without telling us. And when we, when I was due to go into hospital six months ago, um, they just said, sorry, you're not covered. And so I put it off. Uh, last week, the consultant that I went to see said, you need to be there. And she said, uh, I'll ring the surgeon. She rang the surgeon and the surgeon's office rang us back on the afternoon and said, we've, we've had a cancellation, he wants to see you. So I went in on Friday morning at 9 o'clock, 9.15, and the surgeon said to me, I just had a cancellation, I'm going to book you in, you need to do this or you're going to lose your sight within the next three to six months. So then, of course, when we spoke to the secretaries, they said, you know, well, your gap fee is going to be like rob the bank, so which we couldn't. Um, so we talked about remortgaging the house, reverse mortgaging the house. We talked to a couple of other people. Our son said to us, look, I'll loan you the money. Um, and then that afternoon at three or four o'clock, uh, the surgeon's secretary, appointment secretary rang again and said, look, the surgeon says this is quite urgent. Um, he's going to waive the fees. And um, so I praise God. Yeah, thank you. So I just wanted to share that with you this morning. I wanted to share it because I want to honour God in my life. I want to praise the Lord and I want to thank him for what he's doing for all of us in different ways. Sometimes he doesn't do the things that we want him to do. Um, but I want to give thanks to the Lord God this morning because he does support us. He does look after us. He does have his hands underneath us and, and um, holds us. Amen. Hearing Colin Nando's, Colin said uh, that procedure will be tomorrow, so I'm sure we'll support uh, Colin and Jeanette in prayer uh, tomorrow as that takes place. And uh, so I'll commit that to you. Sorry, I forgot to send the kids out earlier. They're supposed to be gone. If, if I ever forget, just get up and go out. That's right. So, yeah, off the kids' church. Kids, sorry. Yep. And I think so. I think the songsters will come. Thank you.
going to continue today to explore the theme of abundant life and some more of what Jesus spoke about concerning abundant life within the kingdom of God. Uh, but to start with, we're also going to look at part of our local mission plan and provide an example of something there. So two different purposes that I'm hoping when we get to the end of the, today, uh, they've all connected up. So our local mission plan, it's focused on the goals uh, we're concentrating upon over the next 12 months for each of the four mission intention areas of the Salvation Army in Australia. I think we're doing pretty well with the vision these days. I think most of you could probably say that if I asked. Wherever there is hardship or injustice, salvos will live, love and fight alongside others to transform Australia with the love of Jesus. Yep, one life at a time, the love of Jesus. But how about our mission intentions? How are we going with those? Who can name one of them? Shout it out. Creating faith pathways. Working for justice. Building healthy communities. Caring for people. Caring for people. That must have been, I think at ALT the other day, I answered them all, now Kev's doing the same for me. <laughs> for use of the local mission plan here at the Launceston Salvos, uh, it tends to be concentrating on some of the bigger picture goals or the longer term goals that might have multiple steps for us to achieve. And I share that simply to say and for you to understand that our local mission plan doesn't cover everything that we're going to be focused upon in the next 12 months but it is the main guide for our mission focus. And it does form the foundation for the area leadership team meetings that are held each month where representatives from all our mission expressions come together uh, to collaborate and build relationships. And uh, Kevin chairs those, so if you want to know anything more about them, speak to Kev. So the, LM, uh, the local mission plan, LMP is the abbreviation, has become central to how we operate at the front line. I haven't gone into do too much detail of the LMP in Sunday morning worship settings as yet, but moving forward I think we probably will by highlighting particular goals and looking at them more frequently. Now this gathering is for us to worship, to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, but it's also to encourage and motivate us for mission, for that sending out, how we can be involved in serving our communities. So today we're looking at one of the outcomes and SMART goals in the Creating Faith Pathways mission intention. Exhibit A. So we want to encourage participation, reaching 75% target of all active soldiers, adherents, junior soldiers and regularly collected members in some form of Bible study or just some discussion based upon the Word of God. There's some examples there, life group, discovery Bible method, discipleship huddles, just getting together one-to-one -one over scripture. I do haven't calculated in detail as yet, but I think we're probably running at about 30 to 40% at the present point in time. So that's the sort of the stretch there. And the goal is to teach, promote and communicate new ways for being involved in reconnection with others for study and discussion of scripture, hence me being here today. And to perform follow-up to identify how people are then connecting and engaging in this way by October 2022. You've got to put a time on it, as if I didn't have enough to do. But anyway, that's all right. This is important. Discipleship is vital. Now, I know some of you already regularly participate in a life group. Excellent. We're already counting you in the 75%. But there might be other ways you wish to be involved also. But for those that are not, this is about acknowledging also that perhaps a life group isn't the most conducive setting for you to just sit down and read someone, read with the scripture with someone. So we're going to explore that by demonstrating another way this morning. One of the examples listed above, the discovery Bible study method. Now it has a simple ABC approach to give it some structure. And I've asked a couple of willing victims to come and help me with this. So I'm going to get some stools and Maria and Nigel are going to come and join me. We'll grab some stools later. Make it a bit more relaxed. Yeah, pick a chair, any chair. I'll take this one. In the middle. Yeah. Front and centre. Don't fall off the stool. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't say that. I haven't done a risk assessment. There we go. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now, the Discovery Bible Study Method, it provides a, a simple yet a structured way of opening the Bible with someone so they encounter God directly through his word. 
and particularly in this case, be they a follower of Jesus Christ already yet or not. Uh, the aim is to help people discover God's truth for themselves. And it's something that can particularly work well in smaller groups, uh, anywhere between two and four people. So the ABC of the Discovery Bible Method. The first step is ask. You know, ask each person how they went with the previous week's commitment. Like, how did you go with? Who did you tell? Now, by the end of the demonstration, you'll see how this cycle completes and how it comes back to the ask. But as is this our first meeting of this little group today in a demonstration, we're going to skip straight to the B, the Bible, uh, but there might be some welcome conversation and all of that as you know you would just when you catch up with anyone. So the B, the Bible, choose a short passage from the Bible. We've chosen today Luke 10, 30 to 37, the Good Samaritan, and also the passage we'll share on later about abundant life. So have someone read it aloud. Maria, would you like to read that for us from the NIV to start with? I will do that. <clears throat> so, in reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. When he saw the man, <laughs> you can stand up if it's better. You don't have to stand at the stool. Yep, that's fine. Need to be comfortable at the group. Yeah. That's <laughs> better. And. Oh my goodness, my knee. Sorry. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite. When he came to the place, and saw him pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he travelled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbour to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? Hmm. The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Perhaps then uh, you might reread the passage again, maybe from a different translation. Uh, so I'm going to have Nigel now read that same passage from the message translation. Jesus answered by telling a story. There was once a man travelling from Jerusalem to Jericho. On the way, he was attacked by robbers. They took his clothes, they beat him up and went off, leaving him half dead. Luckily, a priest was on his way down the same road. But when he saw him, he angled across to the other side. Then a Levite religious man showed up. He also avoided the injured man. A Samaritan travelling the road came on him. When he saw the man's condition, his heart went out to him. He gave him first aid, disinfecting and bandaging his wounds. Then he lifted him onto his donkey, led him to an inn and made him comfortable. In the morning, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take good care of him. If it costs any more, put it on my bill. I'll pay you on my way back. What do you think? Which of the three became a neighbour to the man attacked by robbers? The one who treated him kindly, the religious scholar responded. Jesus said, Go and do the same. So after you've read the passage through there, uh, the idea is then to ask the participants to share that story in their own words. You know, the idea is being, you know, we're not trying to get people to memorise long passages of scripture verbatim, but really just to infuse what the story is and take that into their thinking and into their memory. So, Maria, would you like to tell that story in your own words? Go for it. The floor is yours. Okay. Um, 
there's always context in scripture, isn't there? Someone once said context is king. Jesus is king. Um, the context here is that an expert in the law, so he knew the law, came up to Jesus and asked him, teacher, tell me, what does one do to gain eternal life? Jesus answers his question with a question. How do you read the law? What is it saying to you? <clears throat> Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind and strength and whole, and love your neighbour as yourself. You have said well, said Jesus. Now, go and do this and you will live. But the lawyer, wanting to justify himself, said, so who is my neighbour? And at this point Jesus tells this parable. Rather than answer a question, he gives it in a story, a great storyteller, Jesus. So here goes the parable. There was a man, don't know anything about him, he was on his own, we know that much. He was travelling from Jerusalem to Jericho. As he was going along this road, he was attacked by a bunch of bandits come out of the hills, jumped on him, stripped him of his clothes and all his belongings, beat him and left him for dead, disappeared into the hills from where they came. There he was left, lead, lying on the road, half dead, under the hot desert sun. Well, pretty soon along comes a priest, all dignity and flowing robes. He's walking along and he comes across this man lying on the road. What is he to do? What might he be thinking? Well, if I stop and help him, I might get mugged myself. Never know, dangerous road. Or is it possible? He was thinking, well, <clears throat> he's a priest. Leader of the Jerusalem, the church in Jerusalem, pretty high up and important, anointed, set apart for God to do his holy work. All this is riding on him at this moment. Is that what he's thinking? Well, I'm important now. This man could be dead. If I touch him, I'm immediately impure. I've made myself unclean. I have to go through all the purification process. Holy moly. Um, so, decides not worth the risk, crosses the road and keeps on walking to Jericho. Then, Along comes a Levite. Same thing, he too is set apart for the work of the Lord, taking care of all the things in the synagogue, in the temple works, assistant to the priest. Is the same thing going through his mind? Oh, is he dead? I'll have a look. It doesn't look too good. If I touch him, I will become unclean and I have to go through the whole process. Oh, I don't know. I might get attacked. Anyway, who knows, someone else will come along, cross this road and off he goes to Jericho, leaving that poor man lying under the burning sun, half dead. Next thing you know, a Samaritan comes along. A Samaritan. Genius. Jesus is a genius. Now, he knew and they knew. Imagine the crowd listening to Jesus. <gasps> A Samaritan, that lot, bunch of no-hopers. They hated one another. The Jews and the Samaritans were always enemies. As far as the Jews were concerned, the only true worship was in Jerusalem. And that lot there, they worship who knows where, up on some weird mountain. Anyway, they're useless. They hated each other. So the Samaritan, though, here he comes. He sees that man. He stops. And his heart has been moved with compassion. He gets off his donkey. He kneels down by the man. 
and he cleanses his wounds and tends them. He pours oil, precious oil and wine on them, binds him up, picks him up, gently puts him on his donkey, heads for the nearest inn. There he stays the night, keeping a watch on this man, making sure he's all right. The very next day, he speaks to the innkeeper. He says, here you are, and pays him to denarii, which is two days' wages. And he says, take care of him. I'll be back, and when I return, if I owe you anything else, I will reimburse you. So off he went. So Jesus now pauses, and he says, which of the three, as he speaks to the, the expert in the law, so which of the three, the priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan, which of the three had mercy and compassion on the man? And the expert in the law is like, well, the Samaritan, I suppose. Jesus said, well said. Now off you go and do likewise. She then might, uh, you know, just ask the participants, you know, to spend some time silently reading the passage again. Uh, you might invite people to silently pray for God to speak directly from the passage. If you're doing that with someone who's yet to come to faith, you perhaps judge on, you know, whether they're comfortable yet, you know, praying like that. Um, so there's flexibility in this approach to you know, have to religiously follow every step through that can be tailored to sort of suit uh, the dynamic of the group that you're in. But then it's just asking some open-ended questions such as, what do you see? What does this say about God? What does this say about us? Or what is God saying to you? So Nigel. Yes? I'm going to ask you, what do you see? In that passage, I see that the... The priests, the Levite, they were in their own pious way self-righteous in what they believed in the way they worshipped God. They were people who believed that now that they're in the positions they were in and they were leaders of their community in worship, that they were somehow greater and bigger than anyone else. But I question the situation where I say to myself, well, have they really been touched by the Holy Spirit? Have they been touched to actually give themselves and think of others and to truly walk as Jesus walked. When the Samaritan came along, of course, he was touched by the Holy Spirit. He had compassion, he had caring. He wasn't judgmental of the person that he'd come across. He was there to look after his fellow man. He was there to um, care for somebody in need. And to do that, he was led by his own personal beliefs and his journey with the Lord and he was touched by the Holy Spirit to be able to then um, give of what he could give to assist this man in need. So I see that's with us is to be able to always remember that there is somebody out there who needs us, there's somebody out there who needs us to be to touch them and somebody out there that needs us to, to lead by example. Where in the parable the two priors didn't lead by example. They didn't lead by what they, they, they're in the position of preaching, where the Samaritan led by example. He lives the walk of Jesus. He gave what he could to be able to ensure that this poor man was looked after and that he was, he was saved. And in that doing, also, if we walk the same path, I believe we are saved as well. Thank you. Maria. I'm going to ask you, what does this say about God? Um, well, what particularly stood out for me was that um, it's no use. You can know the Bible back to front, inside out, read it through every year from cover to cover and know it. The priest, the Levite, expert in the law, they would have known their scriptures. But what God was showing me about this was that you have it all up there. If you don't show it and work it out and live it out in some way, demonstrate it, that's all useless to you. So in other words, you know, connect up with what you understand 
Jesus is saying, then do it. And um, love doesn't choose favours. Love doesn't choose who to love. Um, it God, because God doesn't. He loves equally all. And no nation, nationality, tribe, tongue, any, it, no one's better than the other in God's eyes. Uh, so, yeah. And then Nigel, what, what does this say about us? It says that every one of us is always going to be challenged. Every one of us is going to be uh, put um, some form of test in front of us all through our lives. And especially to our faith, it's going to test us and test, test our, our resolve to walking um, with Jesus. And I think the thing is that when we do that, we have to understand that there is always going to be those people around us who will judge us and there'll be people who will judge our faith and they will judge how we worship and they will judge how we are disciples. And I think that with the power of the Holy Spirit, this is where we are above the others. No matter what role we do and no matter where we are in life and what path we take, we can always influence and we can always disciple to others and show our faith with an open heart and an open hand, which then in turn gets rid of those challenges put before us. So that's how I reckon. <laughs> so obviously, you know, this setting here, it's um, a little bit presentation style. A natural group would be, you know, much more informal and relaxed. Everyone would get the opportunity to sort of answer the questions rather than just, you know, one question thrown to each person. It's just to illustrate, you know, those open-ended questions and inviting that discussion. So let the participants do most of the talking, which we did. Don't be afraid of silences. And then the C is commit. Uh, so we want to take some action from this. Let participants suggest their own commitment to whatever God is saying to them. Ask them, what are you going to do? Who are you going to tell? So Maria, what are you going to do? Uh, two words spring to mind, comfort zone. And <laughs> I'm always... <clears throat> Yeah, I feel that this life journey is that I'm being stretched like a rubber band out of my comfort zone. So it's, it's always a challenge, as Nigel was saying, but the thing about living in Christ, Holy Spirit within us, if we trust him, whenever, whenever a situation comes up, he will help enable you to respond in the right way. It's always down to me to respond. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. we've got a long way to go <laughs> on that one. <laughs> but sometimes it's just perfect and it, you go away and think, oh, God, this is wonderful. I love you so much. This is great. And then other times it's like, oh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I really don't want to do that. But he doesn't leave you alone, does he? He no. niggles you, doesn't he? Yep, absolutely. <laughs> so, yeah, basically. Yeah. And Nigel? Who are you going to tell? Everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the word tell, it's not just verbal. It's not just telling everyone. It's about walking the walk and talking the talk. It's about showing and leading by example so that others are influenced in you, so by you, and they want to ask the question, what is it about you that's different? What is it about you that makes you who you are? And that's when you can tell who you are, what you believe, how it's changed you, how it leads your life. And that is your faith. And that is your commitment to the Holy Spirit and to Jesus and how it affects you. And leading by example is, I think, the tell. It's, it's about, because, you know, for some people it's hard for people to go up to somebody and say, hi, <laughs> I believe in Jesus. <laughs> Okay, because that makes them sometimes they feel intimidated or whatever. But I think if you feel, if you can live your life as an example and people see a change in you, especially if you're new um, to your faith and people notice that change who are, not, who are not from the faithful, then I think that is a wonderful tell, especially if they're interested and, of course, they want to um, understand what is the that gives you that light? What is it that gives you the joy that you're having in your life now? And then you can tell them what it is. You can tell them that it's Jesus. You can tell them it's the Holy Spirit. You can tell them that it's 
that you 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 your life glows because of that journey that you're taking. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, very good. So will you thank Maria and Nigel? <laughs> you can escape now. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. So I think you'd agree that's a pretty straightforward approach and something that most of us uh, would feel fairly comfortable just facilitating through or meeting with someone to go through. There is a sheet, uh, uh, we'll put it up, it's just down here at the front, we'll put it up the back, and grab the steps through that ABC, has all the questions on it. On the back page, it has a whole list of suggested scriptures, uh, enough to take you through the first year. Uh, probably is 30 or 40 scriptures on there if you're going to do that. Look, maybe it might be too simplistic an approach for someone who's been under the discipleship pathway for a while. It's just illustrating one different approach to our life groups that you might think, well, I could do that with someone. You know, I could sit down with my neighbour over a cuppa and, and fit that into my week. You know, it might take half an hour if you're doing it one-on-one -on -one with a person. You might be able to put squeeze that into your lunch break. You know, have a couple with someone and, and just read a little bit of a passage of scripture. Because it's difficult in the busyness of our lives to perhaps sometimes fit these things in. But I think, yeah, this is just a, a natural little thing that could be weaved into our everyday life. And the point of sharing this is, you know, we've got to start thinking more flexibly over the locations, the places, the times and the ways with which we engage in people over scripture and perhaps we have done so in the past. You know, it's not necessarily coming to here to do a Bible study or going to someone's home to do a Bible study. But half an hour, let's, you know, just smash it out in the coffee shop. Do you want to read some scripture together? Let's, you know, just be more, I suppose, a little bit more dynamic and uh, flexible about how we approach it. You know, the coordination of how we approach discipleship, it has been a weakness, if I put it that way, of this faith congregation in recent times. You know, I acknowledge that. Uh, the responsibility for creating a richer environment where discipleship can occur does rest in part with leadership. But discipleship is also not something that can be solely driven by me or the senior leadership team. You know, I can talk about discipleship as much as I like. I can encourage you to commit to a life of discipleship and help resource that. At the end of the day, oh, I can't make that decision for you. I can't make that commitment for you. You have to decide that. So I'm always thankful and appreciative of the service that is given by this faith community. Our service is central to our DNA salvationists and uh, fulfilment of the commitments we have made to God in our soldiers' covenant. But don't let that think that that then recludes our discipleship. Discipling is a responsibility of every follower of Christ. And we see it in the great commission that Jesus gave us in Matthew 28, which is on the screen, but the part highlighted today, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. I have about five to ten more minutes of stuff I want to share, but we're just going to sing a song before we do that. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, such a lovely um, way to study the Word and connect with others. I, I found that a real sense of encouragement of a tool that we can use to connect with one another and with others, and I hope and pray that you did um, too. And I, I wondered as, as I was sat there listening, now what? So what will we do now? So, so what? What is our commitment individually? Something for you maybe to reflect on as well. I'm going to invite you to stand as we just sing how um, of God's wonderful love for each of us and let us consider that this morning. God's love to me is wonderful that he should deign to hear the faintest whisper of my heart wiped from my eyes the tear and though i cannot comprehend such love so great so deep in his strong hands my soul i trust he will not fail to keep god's love is wonderful god's love Wonderful that he should give 
gave his son to die for me. God's love is wonderful. God's love to me is wonderful. My very steps are planned. When mists of doubt encompass me, I hold my Father's hand. His love has banished every fear. In freedom I rejoice, and with my quickened ears I hear the music of His voice. God's love is wonderful. God's love is wonderful. Wonderful that He should give His Son to die for me. God's love is wonderful. God's love to me is wonderful. He lights the darkest way. I now enjoy his fellowship till last to endless day. My Father doth not ask that I great gifts on him bestowed, but only that I love him too and serve him here. Please, my friends, be seated. I just want to share briefly on that parable uh, that we've been considering today, this exchange between the religious expert and Jesus. Now, we've been considering what it is to live an abundant life, you know, as Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, where we started. Those who follow him, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. In verse 28 of Luke 10, you'll see the verses that precede the parable there, and when Maria retold the story, she went through those verses there. So I won't read those now, because we've already had that. They're just up on the, up on the screen there. But verse 28, and Maria mentioned this, in the exchange Jesus had with the religious law and teacher, we see him say this, do this and you will live. It's in response to the expert saying, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, and with all your soul, and all of your mind and strength, and love your neighbour as yourself. Now in the Gospels, there are three terms in Greek for life. The first is bios, that's the natural or material existence we experience between birth and death. We're all familiar with that one. You can hear me speaking. You can feel the chair underneath you. You can go home and pat your dog. So we know that. Physical, we have a physical body in which we experience things. This is our bias. And all the computer geeks in the room are familiar with bias being the motherboard that powers the microprocessor on a computer. The second word is psyche. I'm pretty sure we're all familiar with this one too. It refers to one concept of self, our self-consciousness, what we regard as making up a person, relates to the mental or the thinking part of our existence. It's the third one that's used most often when life is talked about in the Gospels. You mightn't be as familiar with the word of this one. It's Zoe, if I'm pronouncing that right. But this is the main New Testament term that takes on soteriological force in describing the gift of life from God and eschatological force in depicting the future hope of life in eternity. Some big words there, isn't there? It's not that hard to understand, really. Trust me. Soteriological simply means the doctrine of salvation. We're simply talking about salvation. The word is describing the gift of life, of eternal life, that is found in the salvation offered by God. And eschatological simply refers to end times, the end of things. So it is referring to that hope we have of eternal life spent in the very presence of God when the things of this physical age have come to an end. God intimately shares his gift of life with people. We're created in his image and he gives everyone the capacity to know his eternal life. So it's this term, Zoe, that appears here in verse 28 when Jesus says, do this and you'll live. This is the life he's talking about. Do this and you'll live. And as is often the case when Jesus was speaking to the religious experts, there's a little bit more going on. This person was an expert in the law. So he would have picked up on the fact that Jesus was actually quoting from Leviticus 18.5 here. It's a little bit of a paraphrase how it appears in Luke. 
but he would have been aware of that. So he turns it straight back on the expert. You know, what is written in the law? How do you interpret it? That's when the religious expert answers with the crux of the God's moral law upon which everything depends. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and soul and mind and strength and love your neighbour as yourself. If Jesus is happy with that answer, you've answered correctly, but then he says, do this and you will live. And in a nutshell for today's purposes, the first few verses of Leviticus 18 speak to the need to follow all the commands of the law, to obey everything that was within it and to be careful and diligent in keeping every aspect of it. If a person does them, he shall live by them. Now, we know perfect obedience to the Old Testament law was an ideal no human was or can ever fulfil. You know, we're failed people. We've all failed in terms of keeping every aspect of the law. The religious expert knew that. So being aware of that, he, he tries to test Jesus again. He tries to sneak in this qualification. And who is my neighbour? No doubt he was hoping for a restriction or a qualification in how it applies, a narrowing down to the scope in the reply Jesus came, gave so it did become humanly possible to obey the law in your own strength. But Jesus goes the opposite away. He goes and tells the parable of the Good Samaritan and rather than narrowing the focus, that blows it right open and how universally it is to apply. He illustrates that anyone in need is my neighbour. Anyone who helps another in need is my neighbour. And anyone who helps me is my neighbour. Our neighbour is anyone in need that we can help. And the help that should be rendered must be lavish and extensive if you're wishing to justify yourself before the law, before God. So in many ways, Jesus makes it an even more impossible ideal to obtain by telling the parable. But then it's verse 36 and 37 that hold the key of the teaching to do this and you will live. The end of the parable, as we heard, Jesus asks, which of these three do you think was a neighbour to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law, giving his due credit, he again answers wisely, the one who had mercy on him. To which Jesus answers, go and do likewise. Mercy is a huge topic. I've only summarised it a little bit for today. But it's the particular focus for what we're looking at in these verses, the abundant life. You know, loving God we'll look at in the weeks ahead. But loving others is our particular focus today. And central to that is the practice of mercy. So here's the summary. Mercy is an emotion, but not just a feeling or emotion. Mercy involves both our disposition, that's our inherent thinking and character, and our action. It is to have compassion, particular focus that comes through throughout the New Testament. So it's a connection of heart and mind with hand. You know, the Gospels never describe Jesus as having mercy without action being involved. Mercy helps alleviate suffering. Though it's commanded and instructed, we can't do it out of a sense of obligation if we truly want to experience the abundant life in God's kingdom that he's talking about. It's action which has to be generous and beneficial at its heart, something that seeks, simply seeks the good of the other person. There doesn't have to be any payback for us. Mercy does not exist if we were able to help, but then don't help the person in need. And therefore, mercy is not necessarily waiting for a request before feeling compelled to respond. A whole connection of heart and hand. And mercy is based in grace. You know, if we think of God's grace his mercy to us, we didn't deserve it. We deserve to be lost forever in our sin because of our rebellion to God's kindness and faithfulness. But we were in desperate need of God's mercy. So in his generosity, he extended his overflowing grace to everyone, everyone in need of salvation. And through that overflowing foundation of grace, we see the link that mercy has to the abundance which God provides us, the abundance of life. You know, if you look at the times in the Gospels where Jesus is described as having mercy, we always also see an abundance. Think of the feeding of the 5,000 or the 4,000. There was an abundance of food left after, after everyone had had their fill. Or the healing of the demon-possessed man from the Gerasenes, when Jesus tells the man to go home and tell of what the Lord has done for you and what mercy he has shown you. Go and tell of how I've done far more than what I needed to because of God's character and disposition of mercy. Well, there's more, much more we could explore on mercy. But I found this a useful quote to help capture the essence of what Jesus was getting at in his teaching on the parable of the Good Samaritan to the religious expert. The ministry of the kingdom, which focuses on human need, 
ultimately fulfills the law when mercy is present. You know, the Jewish leaders often criticise Jesus for things such as healing on the Sabbath, a technical violation of the law, you could say. But Jesus was most critical of the religious leaders because of the neglect of mercy. So abundant life is loving God, loving others, our neighbour. And the abundance of life in loving others is found in the practice of mercy. Mercy is abundant provision to those who are in need. Mercy is required of those who would be Jesus' disciples. And it's both an emotion and righteous action simultaneously. No wonder Jesus said, do this and you will live. Do this and you will zoe. Experience the abundant eternal life of salvation and the future hope of eternity in his presence through living the practice of the mercy of God. And to close today, simply say the practice of mercy, it can not only address physical or emotional needs, it's often where it's based, particularly with our ethic of service as salvationists. But it can, of course, also address spiritual needs, such as forgiveness and teaching. And taking the opportunity to commit to regularly reading the word with someone else is an act of loving your neighbour, is actively living the practice of mercy to someone who's in need who's in need of the truth of the word, how it will transform their life, how it will transform them into the likeness of Christ. Yes, indeed, each of us, each of us are being transformed into the likeness of Christ as we live on the, on the word. So I just know we each can find and will continue to find the abundant life which Jesus promised us as we love others, which includes our commitment to his great commission to teach all that he commanded and to disciple and to be discipled through reading the word together. Let us now spend some time in prayer and in connection with God in considering the word that has been shared today. I pray that he will speak to you mightily in these moments. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond His face away as woods which mother chosen one bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders, ashamed. Wounds have paid my ransom. 
ransom. Well, let's pray together. Even in those words we've just sung, Lord, such a richness of truth and life. The dying breath of Jesus on the cross has brought me life. Eternal, everlasting, abundant life. Oh, Lord, we thank you for the mercy that you have showered down to us through the gift of your Son and the sacrifice that he made. We thank you that Jesus is indeed the living word of God. So, Lord, we just ask that today we may have been encouraged, we may have been strengthened, we may have been prompted to think about things a little bit differently, but just how we can share that life-giving word with others. Lord, help us to understand the importance of just spending that little bit of time each week reading the word with someone. I know we read it ourselves, but reading the word with someone else. Help us to be a people who fulfill your great commission of discipling others, as indeed we will be discipled as we do that. It's what will set things on fire for the kingdom of God in this city, I believe. As we disciple, the power of your spirit will be released through service, will be released through compassion, will be released through the work of our hands. All as we respond to you, We've heard that today. The key is we must respond to you. So may we consider these things in the days ahead. May we share your word at every opportunity we can. We pray in the great name of your son, Jesus. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand, my friends, as we declare the joy, the love of God as we go out this week and we love God, love others in all that we do, in all that we say. So please join as we sing Joyful, Joyful. Joyful, Joyful May God bless you this week and keep you and may you go out into this world shining the love of God and loving others. May God bless you.